please take it away. Thank you very much for that extremely uh, generous introduction, Michelle. Um, <clears throat> so I'm hiding the, the speaker views, so I probably can't see if anybody wants to interrupt, but um, I'll, I'll, you know, feel free. Um, so today, I think uh, I feel almost slightly fraudulent, you know, speaking in a series about all things EFT, because it's, um, it's quite a, a sort of non-perturbative gravitational type of talk. But I decided to focus on the effective part of effective field theory and thinking about how our descriptions of nature can often be effective. We're trying to sort of get something, a description which captures the essence of what is going on. And in order to do that, you know, we often simplify things. And that's a theme that's running through most of the sort of technical part of the work that I'm going to talk about. And of course, it's very powerful when you come up with a simple model. But um, also, I think it can be very interesting where that uh, simple model starts to break down. So again, these are the sort of general themes um, in this talk. So at the bottom, I've partners in crime, uh, my collaborator, Ian Moss, and some students and postdocs um, and other lecturers. So Philip Bordeaux was a student, Florent Michel and Ben Withers were postdocs at Durham and Tom Billum is an atomic physicist at Newcastle. So those shout out to my collaborators. Now, can I get my <clears throat> few, I'm managing to get it to go. So the, the essence of this talk, I'm going to be talking about quantum tunneling. And it's in many ways, it is a really counterintuitive concept. I think we can get quite casual about our counterintuitive concepts in physics, but this is perhaps one of the, you know, one of the biggest ones that we first come to wrestle with and then realize, gosh, we can explain it. So we do feel we understand it well. However, I think what, what I might, the thought I might leave you with <laughs> at the end of the talk is that actually, maybe that's a little bit too glib of a position. And once we start to pick at the concept and, and probe below the surface, we get a bit of a different picture. And, and in the, the theme of this talk is a messier picture. So um, this, this work really arose about thinking about uh, things being messier. And also one of the things that's always kind of puzzled me as being someone who's sort of basically a gravity girl um, is this, con you know, there's this sort of what, conflict between gravity and quantum physics is somehow uh, encapsulated by the nature of the vacuum. You know, the fact that in, from a gravitational perspective, we think of the vacuum in a very different way that we might think about it if we were just doing sort of straight QFT. Um, now, we do think we can work with the vacuum and quantum physics up to a point, and assumptions about our techniques of doing that sort of underlie how we describe Hawking radiation, how we deal with inflation, not just um, the basic picture of inflation, but also describing structure formation. And this research really arose from conversations Ben Withers and I would have over coffee about uh, how simple a picture inflation was and what would happen if we were to sort of, you know, play uh, devil's advocate with it and, and spoil things a little bit. So the plan of the talk is really to sort of, first of all, kind of state the problem. Um, then I want to review the sort of conventional toolbox for talking about tunneling, describe what, how the work I've been doing with, first with Ben and then Ian um, and, and Philip and Florent, how that changes this picture. And then uh, I'll finish off, depending on how much time I've got with, either a little or slightly more PR about um, an experimental consortium that I've got involved in, which is aimed at testing 
some of the uh, aspects I'm going to talk about uh, today and also some other related uh, gravitational phenomena. So that's kind of the plan about the talk. So first of all, the, the problem, well, the problem is really sort of much ado about nothing in a way. It's sort of thinking about is our, you know, what is our vacuum? Um, we might sort of think it's the lowest possible energy state, but um, that sort of assumes there's a lower bound and that we're in it. And so really this is all tied up with the Higgs. And of course that in itself has been an interesting story over the past decade. So in our sort of conventional picture of the standard model, our Higgs field sort of helps to set the scale of the masses of the other particles via the Higgs mechanism. And part of that is of course that the Higgs has a self coupling. So that's on the left of this slide in the um, magnifying glass. So we have our standard toy Higgs potential with the non-trivial vacuum. But it's, that's sort of not, you know, that has a quartic coupling, the Higgs has this self coupling, but that gets corrections, that quartic coupling, as we run to higher energy scales. So these corrections, the calculation depends uh, most sensitively, I guess, on the highest mass particle, the top quark. And in some ways, at least that used to be the least precisely known. So if you calculate how the Higgs coupling runs, uh, the, the picture seemed to be from uh, the sort of typical range of the top mass and the, the, the sort of range of the Higgs mass, it sort of puts us in that little yellow band there, which is where our vacuum is locally stable, but at very high energies, this quartic coupling becomes negative. Now I have to give a proviso here, which is that some more recent analyses by Atlas and CMS have revised that little square box down a bit, um, but I have to freely admit I'm not, I'm not an expert in those sorts of calculations. So I'm still uh, sort of continuing this by saying, if the vacuum is metastable, uh, how might it decay? So <clears throat> if here's a sort of the standard toy picture, of what we mean by metastability. We have a potential which has a local minimum on the left, phi f, but a global minimum on the right, phi t. So those two minima are separated by some small energy difference and there's a large barrier in between. So this is your sort of canonical discussion of vacuum decay. So we call the vacuum on the left a false vacuum because it's not really the lowest energy state, but it has many features of a vacuum in that if you're sitting at phi f, you largely see, apart from a very, very tiny decay rate, you largely see some normal spectrum of, of, of excitations. But of course, because there's a lower energy place, we can tunnel through there again by quantum tunneling. And so what this means is we get a first order phase transition, which takes us from one vacuum to the other. So the problem, coming back to trying to state this problem, is that if we try to describe our standard toolbox, which I'll be uh, sort of going into in more detail in a moment, um, then we get, with based on what the LHC told us, we got a, a lifetime or half-life of the universe, which was stupendously large. Um, so there was no sort of feeling of, of um, you know, impending doom coming from, from the decay of our vacuum. However, the standard toolbox, as I'll sort of show, is very idealized. And first order transitions in nature are absolutely the opposite. It's very hard to get an ideal phase transition. Usually they're very dirty uh, and they tend to be catalyzed. So the examples here are raindrops around dust, Diet Coke and Mentos, not that I've tried that. Um, and so I would argue if we're gonna think about realistic pictures of vacuum decay, we should think about messy pictures. 
And so the message of this talk is that we've taken just the least messy thing that we can do, which is add a black hole, a tiny uh, seed, and that changes the calculation uh, enormously. So uh, moving on to our quantum tunneling, which is, um, I always think is, is so, you know, it's extremely uh, bizarre when you stop to think about it, certainly not what we expect classically. Classically, we would expect if we have a wall, no matter how many times we try and go through it, we will not be able to. However, quantum mechanically, that's just not true because we have our concept of the wave function and that never goes to zero unless you have an infinite barrier. And so that means that you can always have a little bit seeping through uh, any energy barrier. And so this is one of our first toy calculations with the Schrodinger equation, where we look at a problem where we have a, a steady state of particles hitting a barrier. And classically, everything would be reflected quantum mechanically. We have some reflected and some transmitted. We solve the Schrodinger equation. We find that uh, you know, we place the right boundary conditions that are superbly uh, cooperative potential. And we find an expression for the transmission probability, which has an exact form, but it has a leading order behavior of an exponential suppression. So this kind of fits with the idea that this should be very rare, this tunneling probability. And so it looks like a frequency, except an imaginary frequency, which is given by the energy, the difference in energy between the energy of the particle and the barrier height, and then times the distance. So it's, it's telling you about how much barrier, the sort of cumulative barrier that you've got to get across. So that, that the, the sort of takeaway from this is that tunneling is exponentially suppressed and that the exponent is something that's telling you about the amount of barrier and you do an integral of the, um, if you like, a square root of the energy uh, discrepancy through the distance of the barrier. Now we can link this to a very intuitive picture, which is quite classical by analytically continuing to Euclidean time. So let's suppose we flip our potential and we have a, a particle at rest just on the lip. It drops down and it converts the potential energy delta V into kinetic energy, a half X dot squared. So our integral of root two delta V dx, we can turn into an integral with respect to our tau um, by using that expression for X dot squared. So this is now just the integral of two delta V d tau. We then convert one of those delta Vs to the half X dot squared. And then we look at what we've got, which is like a Euclidean Lagrangian, it's X dot squared plus V instead of minus V. So what we've turned this into is our exponent is now something which is a Euclidean action or it's yeah, a Euclidean action of a particle, classical particle motion in the inverted potential. And so a more general potential, if it's not this very cooperative sort of square well, would now give you the same, you have the same visualization where your particle is originally at the, oh, sorry, I thought I might be able to, is originally at this minimum, so that's where you're sitting, your quantum particle. You invert the potential. It's now sitting at the top. It rolls down to a point exit point, which is the, at the arrowhead on the left, and then rolls back again. So it kind of has this bounce, which was my got called a bounce for a while. And so this is this sort of Euclidean picture that generalizes to quantum field theory. So, I mean, the first generalization was sort of to a multi-dimensional quantum uh, sort of Schrodinger type of picture going from a false vacuum to a true vacuum sort of tunneling across 
a most probable escape path. And then that gives you a sort of the, the route to field theory. And so Coleman and others in the 70s uh, developed this picture of tunneling in field theory where you take this dominant exponent. So you've kind of lost the, the full detail of the, the Schrodinger solution to the Schrodinger equation, and you've taken the dominant um, exponential amplitude for the half-life. And so you have this picture of having the false vacuum and then the, the process which takes you to the true vacuum is a bubble of true vacuum inside the false vacuum in Euclidean time. So you analytically continue and then you look for a solution to Euclidean field equations. And then you compute the action of that Euclidean solution and that gives you your exponent. And so that's the process that was developed. What does it look like? You get a bubble appearing that then expands. So I didn't, don't want to sort of go and sit and talk about Euclidean field equations. So I want to describe instead how we get the same answers by more uh, qualitative or intuitive arguments. And this is what I call the Goldilocks bubble. And so the idea here is that there's a just right bubble. So quantum fluctuation gives you a bubble of true vacuum. And if it's a small bubble, then it's essentially too, you know, you've got a cost of forming a bubble, which is the energy in the bubble wall. And that's where your field is going through this big barrier. Um, and the gain in energy is the fact that in the inside, you've gone from the false to the true vacuum so that you get that energy back. So if the bubble's too small, there's too much surface area, and so it recollapses. If it's too big, sure, it can expand, but it's quite expensive to form. So just right means the bubble's just big enough that it doesn't collapse. So that's the Goldilocks bubble, where things are just right. And so we, we find an equation which is saying what the cost is. The cost is the energy density of the wall times its area, which of course is now, is now it's, um, the area is three-dimensional, hence the R cubed. And then you've got the energy gain, which is the energy difference, epsilon, times the internal volume, which is now the volume um, inside the three-sphere. So we make that stationary, that balance stationary with respect to R. We get a, a radius of our bubble, and then we calculate the overall cost, the energy, the bounce action. And that's what we get. And this is, in, that's what Coleman, it's this intuitive picture. And that corresponds really well to the full Euclidean uh, field theory um, act computation where you solve the four dimensional Euclidean um, equations of motion. So this gives us our leading order saddle point approximation to this amplitude probability of decay. So that's the sort of standard picture, but of course that was the picture of the 70s, but it's not the full picture because vacuum energy is energy, therefore it's gonna gravitate. So we have to include gravity. And of course, I think one of the, you know, it depends on how comfortable you are with these arguments. I guess I did my PhD in Damped in, in Cambridge in the relativity group with Gary Gibbons and Stephen Hawking. So I'm, I don't, I'm comfortable with these sorts of arguments, but I just like, if, you, if you're feeling nervous, um, I just like to say, you don't need to know precisely what quantum gravity is in order to make progress on these questions. All you have to do is to look at what's reasonable to do well below the Planck scale. And we do this actually quite frequently. We don't argue with the calculations about Hawking radiation because we feel that we kind of know, um, at least you know, within certain regimes that we, we feel that they're correct. So below this Planck scale, we feel it's reasonable to say that space-time is basically classical, but gravity contributes 
to quantum effects through looking at the wave functions of fields on a classical background and then the back reaction of those quantum modes on the space time. And for non perturbative solutions, such as the tunneling ones, this is particularly unambiguous. So you take, you add in the Einstein Hilbert action to your particle physics type of action, and you then look for saddle points or class, sort of this is our semi classical approach. You look for saddle points in that solutions to that action where you rotate to Euclidean time. If you're at finite temperature, you would have a finite periodicity of Euclidean time. So that's sort of the approach. And you can argue with it, but that's what it is. Okay, so if we think about a positive vacuum energy, then positive energy is positive cosmological constant, and that's to sit a space time. So we can represent to sit a space time as a, uh, a surface embedded in one dimension higher. So the, if we're in Lorentzian space time, it's a hyperboloid. If we're in Euclidean time, it's a sphere. And so here, what you're seeing is the sort of blue Lorentzian de Sitter and the red Euclidean de Sitter. And so our solution, our tunneling solution, has to take our space time, which is round, and replace it with an, a zero energy. So what I've done here is I've, I guess I've made an assumption that uh, I'm tunneling from positive vacuum energy to zero. And that's purely for convenience because it's easiest to draw. It's easier to take the sphere and just cut a, cut a sort of the nose off it. So that's, that's the sort of example of what a tunneling a bubble might look like when you include gravity. So this is saying that when you include gravity, positive energy is to sit so that's a sphere and a zero energy would have to be flat. So I cut the sphere and the black line circle there is the wall. Now, Coleman and De Lucia did this in the early eighties, but they did it by solving the Einstein equations for an infinitesimally thin wall. But you can also do the Goldilocks argument because you know what the difference is between the un, uh, an untunnel de Sitter and this uh, bubble configuration because you just take the energy in the wall and the energy that you've gained from the cap of the sphere that's been cut off. So it's a similar sort of balance. You've still got that sigma r cubed from the wall, but now the energy that you've gained looks a bit different because instead of having a flat, your energy inside a flat sphere, it's actually inside this sort of cap. So there's more volume in there, but it works. And you get an answer, uh, which is somewhat similar looking, some, you know, that you've got now some Gs in it, but the sending Newton's constant to zero gives you the same answer that you had before. So you've got the same picture, too small a bubble is sort of, you know, will re-collapse and large bubbles are harder to make. And this just right bubble corresponds to the solution that Coleman and De Lucia got by solving the full Euclidean-Einstein equations. So that was the standard, the gold standard, if you like, for a calculational method uh, that had been developed in the 70s and early 80s. And that's what everybody would use to calculate tunneling rates um, up until, well, just not that many years ago, actually. Um, and so, you know, that would, that, that's kind of, this is what I'm telling you is the, the canonical picture. So no problem with the LHC half-life well in excess of the age of the universe. However, it's very, very idealized. The Coleman universe is empty, it's featureless, it has a huge amount of symmetry, 
And that is just nothing like first order phase transitions that we see in nature. So the question is, can we throw in a little impurity? So that was what we kind of considered. So the impurity that we looked at originally was putting in a black hole. So the reason for doing that is because if you put a bubble around sort of exactly centered on the black hole, that is exactly soluble. You do not need to make any ansatz for your solving the Einstein equations. You can integrate them up completely. So you find a solution that has four parameters, which is the inside lambda, the inside uh, vacuum energy and the outside vacuum energy, an inside mass of the black hole and an outside mass. Uh, and so when, when you say a mass outside the shell, um, the mass of a black hole is not necessarily determined close up. You can decide what a mass of an object is far away by looking at local tidal forces. So you have a local Riemann curvature of tidal forces um, that tells you what M plus is. But you could also interpret M plus as being the original black hole that seeded the decay. So that's, that's what we, we looked at because it is the simplest thing you can do that destroys some of that symmetry, but retains a lot of analyticity. And so you can do all the same type of steps, your Goldilocks bubble, calculate the action. And so we did this and found that putting in a black hole tended to lower the action. And of course, we then I'll be describing this. Uh, the, the next step is to make sure that what, how does the tunneling rate compare to other quantum processes like evaporation? And of course, at the moment, everything I've been describing is in terms of Coleman's idealized tunneling with a very thin bubble wall where I can sort of draw it and talk about Goldilocks bubbles uh, without having to do much of a calculation. Of course, if we're going to apply this to the standard model, we have to do it for the standard model, Higgs potential, and that gives a bit of a different picture. It's a very thick bubble. Okay, so let's just go and fill in some of the gaps there. I think one thing I just want to say, just very briefly with a technical aside, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, um, if you Euclidianize the Schwarzschild solution, you actually end up with a periodic Euclidean time if you demand that your Euclidean solution is non-singular. And so this was what, when Gibbons and Hawking did their sort of original, you know, seminal paper with the uh, Gibbons-Hawking boundary term, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they sort of found that Euclid in time was periodic and bingo, it had exactly the right periodicity for the Hawking temperature of the black hole. So that's why they got very excited. Um, now, ju just again, part of the technical aside is just to note that when you're doing these calculations, you have to uh, often do a background subtraction. And this introduces this, a technicality where part of your background subtraction means you have to look at integrating over these conical, um, conical singularities, if you like, to, to make the right background subtraction. And that's actually crucial to the calculation. And it was missed when people first tried to do this back in, in the 80s. They sort of just didn't appreciate that you really needed to deal with, with this um, singularity issue. Um, and it's we've we've sort of done various checks about this, and in particular, we we look at the Coleman de Lucia instant on in such a way that it has a conical singularity and get the right answer. So we're pretty sure this is the right thing to do. Okay, so what's the Goldilocks game? So our setup is we have a bubble with the black centered on the black hole. Outside is the different mass, that's the seed mass, and we can have a remnant inside. Now, I said there were four parameters. If you're just solving the Einstein equations, you can have a lambda plus, a lambda minus, an M plus, an M minus. 
But for a given M plus, you have a range of different M minuses for which the solution exists. In general, the solution depends on Euclidean time. But for each seed mass, there's a unique bubble with lowest action. If the seed mass is very small, it's time dependent, and there's no remnant black hole. If you have a large seed mass, the bubble is a sort of independent of Euclidean time, but it has a remnant. So there's, there's an M minus. Now, the last, the last case is actually the one that's relevant for the standard model bubbles. And if you have one of these um, in bubbles that doesn't depend on Euclidean time, then the action of the instanton is just the difference in area between the seed and remnant black holes. So the remnant black hole is kind of smaller than the seed. So in essence, your entropy is dropping. And that's exactly why you expect it to be exponentially hard to do. So from a thermodynamic perspective, you're, you're sort of expecting that process to be Boltzmann suppressed. So it all kind of fits in to a you know, sort of fit very physically reasonable picture. So what, what's happening is that you can think of the periodicity of Euclidean time as changing the balance of this Goldilocks equation. So instead of having sort of some, you know, pi factor times r cubed for the area of the wall, it's now four pi r squared times that Euclidean periodicity. And the volume also changes. So your bounce now is directly related to this uh, periodicity of Euclidean time. And therefore it's related, the bounce action is related inversely, if you like, to the black hole mass. And so what this is telling you is that small black holes would have smaller actions and therefore larger tunneling probabilities. And so this is leading you to, um, to realize that very likely cedar tunneling is going to be easier than the sort of Coleman de Lucia, very um, symmetric one. So I said that we have to be careful because of course, it's not the only thing that can happen. Black holes evaporate. The temperature is inversely proportional to the mass. And therefore, as your black hole gets smaller, the temperature gets hotter and therefore it's going to lose heat even more rapidly and lose mass even more rapidly. So you have to compare this evaporation rate to that tunneling half-life. And so your evaporation rate is a power law, whereas the tunneling rate or, or half-life is an exponential. And so normally that would make you think, well, surely evaporation wins, maybe. What turns out to really matter is two things. You've got, first of all, let's look at what the exponent is. So we've obviously computed these bubble actions in full, but what, what we notice when we find numerically these sort of standard model type bubbles, we see that the seed and remnant masses are very close. Now, actually, this is not all that surprising because if we think about sort of Planck units or, or sort of Planck scales, our black hole is sort of something that's happening at a gravitational sort of scale, it's very um, big. Um, and whereas the coupling, you know, the gravitational constant is very weak. So we can have quite a thick cloud of some Higgs going through some barrier and it may not have that much of an impact on the mass of the black hole because our gravitational coupling is so weak. So what we see is that in Planck terms, um, the, the, the discrepancy between our seed and remnant mass is very small. So just being doing a hand-waving argument, if we sort of say that, you know, we're close to a Schwarzschild type of solution so that our radii are tracked by the mass, we would say that the difference in area, which is the difference in, in the um, Schwarzschild radius squares, is roughly 
the sum of the masses times the difference of the masses, which means our exponent is roughly m delta m. So that means that yes, it's exponentially suppressed as a function of m, but our exponent, the multiplicative factor in m, in the exponent for m, is small. Okay, now on the other hand, if we look at our um, evaporation rate, which is power law and going like one on m cubed, uh, that has a small prefactor, which was calculated by Don Page in the 70s. So we have a small prefactor of our power law. And in our exp exponent, we also have a small multiplying factor. So that means that there is an opportunity, a window where our exponent now has sort of come off the strongly damped uh, part and is beginning to sort of creep up. Um, whereas because of this, this, this 10 to the minus four prefactor in the evaporation rate, it's, uh, it, you know, that, that it can dominate. So here I just plotted uh, as an, an indicative plot where we look at the, this branching ratio of the uh, tunneling rate to the evaporation rate um, as a function of delta M. So I've taken how it depends on the mass of the seed and looked at how that also depends on delta M. So you see that there's, as delta M drops, the range over which the tunneling winds becomes larger and larger. And in fact, the standard model the sort of range is, is sort of goes even further to the right. So here, um, the x-axis is the mass of this, the M, the seed, in Planck masses. So you want to be really up above 10 to the 3 in order to feel that you've got any justification for using these semi-classical methods. And you see that, for example, that red curve is where the, the tunneling rate is a factor of 10 to the 8 more significant than the evaporation rate. So it's, um, you know, that this is sort of just as a, as a sort of ballpark illustrator, this sort of shows that, in fact, the tunneling really can win. However, note where it's winning. It's winning where you've got black holes sort of between a gram and a kilogram. So the only way that you can get this thing happening is if you have a black hole that's very close to its end line, you know, its, it's sort of final moment of death. Um, and that means it has to be a primordial black hole. So only a primordial black hole is potentially light enough to evaporate so that its temperature is above the microwave background temperature. And only black holes lower than about five times 10 to the 14 grams when they're formed would be evaporating now. So once they hit this mass, the evaporation, uh, the lifetime at that point is incredibly fast, 10 to the, I don't know, minus 22 seconds. So what it means is the decay is, is just instantaneous. It's really, it, it just switches on. Um, and so if we have primordial black holes that would now be evaporating away and there's nothing beyond the standard model to, to or, or if, the, if, the, if the Higgs is really metastable, then we have a problem, that's the message. So that, that's the, I think, I find I'm always faster when I sit and talk. <laughs> Um, so that's really, that's the work that, that we've done. And that's really the main sort of part of the physics that I wanted to discuss. But I just like to sort of finish off by taking things in a, in a rather different direction um, and just say a bit more about some of the questions that people are thinking about more generally. Um, I think one of the questions that not just myself, but other, other groups in different ways have been um, coming back and, and, you know, really challenging is this Euclidean tool, this, this instanton method. It's a useful tool, 
but how much is it really telling us what's going on? I mean, one of the puzzles is uh, in relativity, we don't have a unique time. So what does it really mean anyway? Why do we analytically continue just in time? Shouldn't we be continuing space? I know Neil Turok's been thinking about that. Um, or should we even be trying other techniques? So that's something that's been explored by um, uh, Ponson, Braden, Feinfurtner, and Pyrus. Um, I know I didn't say it alphabetically, but right, there we go. Um, so they're actually looking at a completely real time technique. So what should we be trying? Quantum mechanical tunneling is really well tested. That's sort of non-relativistic though, really. So how do we know our pictures of relativistic tunneling are good? And so this is why people have sort of turned to analog systems or tabletop tests because analog systems can be constructed that mimic relativistic systems, at least in certain regimes. And so myself and Ian started to get interested with whether we could actually test, not just test tunneling, or QFT tunneling, but maybe even seeded tunneling. And so this was how we got involved in this consortium. So just to sort of say this was um, an idea about, uh, oof, eight years ago now, uh, by Fialco et al, who proposed a tabletop experiment, potentially, where you could create a false vacuum using um, a BC. Uh, so you put a Bose pass in an optical trap, it has two spin states, but um, then you, you couple them with a microwave field, but then modulate the amplitude of the field, which stabilizes a false vacuum state where the two spins are sort of uh, misaligned or anti-aligned and the vacuum state is where they're aligned. So you create this, this very shallow minimum to be fair. Now I've put a little star there because one of the things that, uh, that, the, that uh, Braden, Johnson, Pyrus and Weinfurtner have also pointed out is that there is uh, even though it looks like this stabilizes the system, there may also be a flocke instability in the system. So this system, this first idea probably doesn't work as is, but Ian's been looking at other BCs that may be a bit more complicated, but have a robust false vacuum. Anyway, this was our first calculation. Um, and so we tried two different ways of, of looking at calculating the tunneling rate. We did a sort of Euclidean method, which gave um, exactly the same sort of result of seed decay being enhanced. In this case, the seed is, is a topological defect in the vacuum. And then our, our friendly atomic physicist, Tom Billum, used a, a truncated Wigner method, um, which is kind of that little picture on the left, which is more of a, a real-time approach and is indeed kin to the type of approach that Braden and Co are using in their exploration of tunneling. Um, so, so we were getting interested about exploring this uh, seeded vacuum decay. Anyway, so this takes me on to the um, QCMFP consortium um, where we're sort of looking at these testing some of these ideas about QFT, uh, relativistic quantum field theories, and gravitational physics. So it's a, it's a quantum technologies consortium, part of the STFC funded quantum technologies program. It, it's a mix of uh, people like me, sort of STFC theorists that work on uh, cosmology or black holes and also people more from the EPSEC side in both theory and experiment. Uh, so cold atoms people, quantum optics people, um, and superfluid and optomechanics people. And we also have external partners. And so we're really just trying to, uh, to look at questions that you just can't test in the lab. So we, you know, we're not sort of saying these are precise analogs to some of these, these uh, processes. It's simply trying to validate certain toolboxes. And actually, one of the interesting things is that it's where the systems are imperfect 
replicas or, or analogues of the relativistic system. That's kind of some, in some ways, where the interest starts to um, to come out. So these, some of these slides are from some of my SW is Silky Vinefield, my SP is Sam Patrick. Um, so we have two main experiments or, or themes. One is the quantum vacuum, which is what I've already talked about, and the other is a quantum black hole. And I kind of got, uh, I got sort of sashayed off into the quantum black hole side, which is actually proving to be a lot of fun. So what's a quantum or uh, analog black hole? It's this idea, old idea of Bill Unruh, where he sort of thought about waterfalls and the fact that if the water falls over fast enough, then you get essentially a sound horizon. And maybe by exploiting this analogy, you could test ideas of Hawking radiation. So that's the sort of basic picture. How does it mimic? Well, if you have things like uh, surface waves on a fluid, we know what our fluid equations are, and they have this sort of tanch term, but if we have either long wavelength or a very deep fluid, then we can approximate this by its sort of lead, whoop, leading order term, still have to get used to this, um, which gives you something that is almost a Klein-Gordon equation. So that long wavelength propagation at the back, you see you've got your Laplacian, um, as well as a sort of modified time derivative. And so you can rewrite that in a sort of tensorial form where you have components of a metric, a sort of effective metric. But of course, that's just like a Klein-Gordon equation. And so what Silke orig originally set up was this a very, very controlled um, Bath jacuzzi is a bathtub where it's it's a very large tank with a plug in the middle, and so when you let the water drain, you have a, a very very uniform uh, flow. It's draining, so you have that d on r flow in, and then you've got a rotational component as well. And so this is kind of analogous to a Kerr black hole. So. The velocity field on the left there corresponds to this sort of two plus one dimensional metric. And so you do get sort of horizons and ergo regions. And so that's uh, that, that was sort of, that's if you like a classical uh, experiment. And so what, what Silke wants to do is she started off on the left with a classical surface, a classical experiment, classical angular momentum, classical surface waves. And this gives you anal an anal analogies to your classical space-time and classical relativistic fields. So the first step, which we're quite, well, we, she, it's quite a long way down, um, is to quantize angular momentum. So what happens if you no longer have this sort of continuous process of things, you know, scattering? What if you've got some quantized um, in this case, angular momentum quantum number. But the, rip, the surface waves are still sort of classic, uh, classical riplons. So that's sort of like a quantum, it's almost the opposite of what we usually do, a quantum space time with classical fields. But the, fine, the aim is to get, uh, sort of to put it more or less on a chip and get quantized angular momentum with quantum uh, riplons. And to start testing some of these, you know, some of, the, the things that we normally do with black holes with, with a sort of continuous range of parameters and starting to sort of see what happens when you, you start to um, change things. So this is her lab in Nottingham. So I realize I didn't update. I know they have got down to 1.5 to 2K and they are seeing the superfluid phase. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't update that slide. And then just finally, the other part of that is that we're looking at uh, black holes in one, one plus one black holes in fiber optic cables. So this is uh, what we're doing with, with uh, my postdoc, Theo Torres. Um, and again, we're sort of wanting to look at uh, sort of correlations and how things ring, ring down. So the soliton 
oscillations. So I think I'm pretty much out of time. So let me just wrap up. Um, vacuum decay is, is it's really interesting because it's, it's fundamentally quantum process. But if you're going to be honest about it, you have to include gravity, which we kind of think we know how to do, but it's a very idealized tool. And it also, you know, it, we, if we try and introduce just a little bit of inhomogeneity, it seems like the answer has changed quite significantly. So the first message is, if we don't stabilize the Higgs vacuum, then we've got a, a problem if we've got primordial black holes that are too light. But I think, you know, it's, it's true that there's plenty of new physics potential, um, but I'm very keen that the vacuum is stabilized, let me put it that way. Um, and I think the other sort of side of this is where I've focused on talking about the tools that we use and just asking questions about how good are they? Um, you know, that this truncated Wigner method that is also got issues because you're essentially assuming that you're, you know, you're sort of populating your vacuum and that in itself is actually adding energy into a system. So I think, I think this, it's really, the time is ripe to really sort of reanalyze how we describe tunneling and maybe come up with some better ideas. So that's my challenge to the listener and I'll stop there. Thank you very much.